Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 133 of Two Minute Talk Tips, the podcast that opens with a practical public speaking tip in the first two minutes before getting into a deeper discussion about public speaking. Today's tip comes to us from special guest Charles White. Be vulnerable. Vulnerability helps you connect with your audience more. Vulnerability adds this layer of realness to the presenter that most of the time people think it is a unattainable level, but if you help the audience connect with you on a layer of vulnerability, then they're more able to take whatever that key tip is that you're trying to get across to them and saying that actually is attainable because I didn't always know that, or I wasn't always acting in this way. I didn't, I wasn't always this person and you can be this person now too, because I've been where you're at and you can now be where I'm at. Stick around. And after the break, we'll hear more from Charles White. Welcome back. Charles White thinks a lot about process. As a technology coach for non-tech entrepreneurs, he helps folks streamline and automate parts of their business with widely available tech tools. He coaches entrepreneurs and speakers through the One Million Cups program. He's even articulated a formula for motivational success that actually includes square roots of all things. We talk about that program, his coaching in South Africa, co-working spaces, and about his process for crafting his TEDx talk. So now, let's meet Charles White. So Charles, thanks so much for joining us on Two Minute Talk Tips this week. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you've done a lot of speaking in a lot of different places, but what is your earliest memory of speaking to a group or performing in front of a group of people? You know, I really had to think about this because really as far back as I could remember, even in grade school, I was in in front of some sort of audience. And I actually lived in Italy for two and a half years with my mom, my stepdad, and my sister. And during Mother's Day, uh, our class put together this little kind of performance for all of the mothers. And uh, I'm not going to sing it to you right now, but I actually <laughs> still remember some lyrics from the song that we sang that day. And that would probably be my first experience of really being in front of an, an audience that we had to prepare for, we had to memorize, that we practiced, and and that we really got to you know perform in front of, of people that we really cared about. Uh, after high school, actually, it it was the my junior year of high school was the last time that I did any sort of performance for theater, and it wasn't one that uh, it, it, my senior year I had to make a decision in between. I'm either going to do this next play or I'm going to go get an after school job so I could get gas money and <laughs> and do the the senior year of high school thing. So that's that's ultimately what I what I ended up doing. Right. The classic choice that folks make. You know, these days you're still doing a lot of speaking. You love the stage. You're comfortable with it. So what are you doing in that five minutes before you take a stage? Well, just like actually the five minutes before I came on this, I did some deep breathing. And that really just helps to, I feel, just calm my nerves down and just get everything within focus so before I step up on stage and before I even open up my mouth to the audience for the very first time, then I know that I am fully centered, ready to go, and I'm not going to get out of breath. That's, that's I feel sometimes that uh, you get a little anxious and you start taking shorter breaths and you start getting a little bit too much into your own head. So I just try to Focus on the breathing for those five minutes. Take some nice, great, deep breaths. And that really gets me ready. Yeah. I talk to a lot of people who, who, do, who do that, who find that, that deep breath, deep breathing ritual, for lack of a better term, is just becomes very important, not only for getting that extra oxygen, but also for signaling your mind to enter this different 
state, this is what we're going to do now. And every time before we go out and conduct ourselves in a presentation or on a podcast or, you know, some other form of show that it, it sw helps switch the mindset over to that mode. Absolutely. I feel that there are the kinds of habits that you create on a daily basis or, or within specific event triggers that really, like you were talking about, help to create that instantaneous, oh, okay, we are now getting into this specific activity or we're about to do this. Um, maybe not related to any kind of public speaking, but uh, and, I, and I'm not saying I'm great at it, but when I bowl, I actually have a very specific way that I breathe, just the same way that you step up to the line and, and the way that you throw it. I try to get as consistent as I can with each one of those steps. And I find that any time that I'm off with my breathing in that aspect, then I throw off and I'm off to the left or off to the right. And it's, and it's, I mean, almost in someone else's lane, it's that important to have those kinds of rituals that triggers your brain to say, okay, now this is what we're doing. And I remember this part and I don't have to worry about that anymore. In, in some respects, it's like uh, hitting a keystroke in Excel that launches a macro. Absolutely. Any kind of muscle memory that will put your body within that familiar space that you know that's uh, where it's at, what is going to happen when you do those certain movements, then it becomes so much easier to do the rest that you don't have to focus on. Right. And, and that's awesome to acquire, to figure that out uh, in your life and figure out how to apply those tools elsewhere. So how does your public speaking now that you're doing, how does this support your business today? So in public speaking, actually in front of a, a live audience, I do some talks within Austin at different co-working spaces. And, and I'm actually just kind of reintroducing myself. I, I lived in Austin from 2000 to 2013. And then I actually moved to New Mexico for five years. And I just recently moved back about uh, seven or eight months ago now. And so I'm, I'm reaching out back into the community to get reantiquated with them and doing talks at these, these co-working spaces around other entrepreneurs, around other professionals. And, and what is a co-working space? Oh, well, a co-working space is where a individual or a smaller business typically holds a... Uh, and, and kind of an informer, informal desk, or they could actually pay for an office. But it's it's much more of a collaboration space for solopreneurs and for consultants and for digital nomads to be able to have a physical space that they could go to that they rent out. Uh, let's say you could either pay for a desk that is just yours or just access to a space where you just kind of take the stuff with you at the end of the day and you come back and it could be at another area of the uh, of this kind of office open office space and it's a really great way to get connected to the to the community and if again if you are a company of one it is a really great way to stay motivated and have a, another place to go to instead of staying at your house or working from a home office and and not being around anybody because if you are a solopreneur or working for another larger corporation but remotely it can get a little bit lonely working from home all the time yeah absolutely and and sometimes you know you may have to meet with somebody locally and there's only so many times you can go to a meeting at a starbucks and you don't necessarily want to invite a new business colleague to your home but being able to have access to those spaces and those conference rooms and those other services they provide is a nice easy way of getting into it without picking up the whole infrastructure of renting an actual office Absolutely. Co-working spaces are this great phenomenon that's that's really taken off in the past, I'd say, 10, 15 years because of the way that we have changed around how we work, because we are no longer regulated to being in the same office together. And in fact, people... Uh, 
that live in the same city could be working together, but never have to actually physically meet in person because of the tools that are now available to us. Co-working spaces, um, and some of them are localized, and there are some international co-working spaces. For instance, WeWork. If you could pay for a single subscription. It's, it's kind of like a subscription to their office space. You could start off, let's say, here in Austin and go over to any of their other locations in New York or in LA or in another country. And it's just that one fee that you pay and you instantly have an office space, again, with all those amenities as well as local connections that you could just feel at home at. Kind of like a health club for your brain. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's just the same kind of model. So, so you've been speaking at some more of these co-working spaces then? Absolutely. And it's, you know, part of it is to get reintroduced to the community and to just connect to local entrepreneurs and business people, because not it's not just about having a, a business where you can, you know, do business with anybody. It's, it's again about having that, that local group of people that you could call up and, and say, well, let's work together today. Or, you know, I have a question, can we meet for coffee? And that, that one-on-one -on -one physical connection is, I feel something always that people are going to be looking for, regardless of how, great the tools are that we have that allow us to be able to collaborate and to talk and to communicate. It's just something that you can't replicate digitally. Right, right. So, I, you know, I, th I find this is really interesting. The idea of, you know, obviously there's a lot of potential for finding new customers among the entrepreneurs and the services that you're able to provide. But how does, how do you go about then getting on, for lack of a better term, the the speaking circuit for the local co-working spaces. What what does that process look like? Well, for me, I do a lot of outreach online first. There are a lot of different Facebook groups for, especially here in Austin and in pretty much any major city or, or even minor city that has some sort of entrepreneurial network going on. They have these online groups that have conversations going on all the time. And people that own these co-working spaces will reach out and say, I am looking for speakers or I am looking to do these kind of events. So you just respond to them, start the conversation there, and then um, – schedule something. In fact, I had never even been to the, the latest co-working space before the day that I had actually showed up and, and did my talk. And it, it was really a, a great experience because it allowed me the freedom to be able to schedule it without physically having to travel back and forth and, and do you know that, that dedicated time to be able to actually schedule that. That's awesome. So these co-working spaces, then, it sounds like they have their own schedule of events that they want to host for their clients and to, to provide that extra value of not only can you get this space, but we're going to bring in these speakers. We're going to bring in these presenters who can help you learn more about how you can be more effective in your business. Absolutely. And that's actually a lot of the reasons why I feel that people want to belong to a co-working space is because of the resources that they provide outside of just having another place to go to. It is the, the connections that you make and the knowledge from those connections that you can acquire by just being there when something's happening. It, it really becomes about, you know, sort of building a community there. Exactly. They're localized communities. And sometimes the co-working spaces are very specific. They only accept people that are in biotech or they only accept people that are in the technology space. So they are becoming so niche down, even within the co-working spaces, that the people that subscribe to them, whether it's for the full time or just one or two or three days a week, get the most benefit out of the people that are surrounding them. You, you also spent some time in Albuquerque hosting a weekly event. Uh, tell us a little bit about that event and how that came to happen. So this event was 
a group that I had sought out because I wanted to connect to the local community. And anywhere I went, I kept on hearing that this was the group that I needed to connect to. And this is the group that I needed to, to uh, just be a part of. And so I finally went and it's called One Million Cups. It's actually done by a nonprofit organization out of Kansas City called the Kaufman Foundation. And they actually host this weekly event or monthly events across the United States on Wednesday mornings. And the whole idea of this organization is to bring local entrepreneurs in front of an audience to be able to do a quick presentation about their business and not only talk about the things that they've accomplished, but also talk about the things that they're currently struggling with. And that's the thing that really drew me to this community was that they were able to be vulnerable about not only are have they been doing these amazing things, but I'm also in this area where I don't know everything. And what's great about it is that it's a short presentation followed by this 20 minute Q and A. And this Q and A is with everybody that's in the audience and they get to the audience gets to ask the entrepreneur any kind of question or give any kind of feedback, not only about their presentation skills, but also about the areas of their business that they are struggling with the most right now. So it's kind of like if you've ever heard the term mastermind, it's like a mastermind for 20 minutes, helping and focusing on that one entrepreneur to get to that next level that they're really looking to do. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a mastermind group meets Toastmasters. Absolutely. It is. It's it's a style of presentation that is extremely unique and, and probably you're never going to use that same presentation anywhere else. <laughs> but you're going to get so much value out of just that 20 minute inter interaction, as well as the networking that happens afterwards because of it. And I think that's really powerful, too, because you don't usually think of a lot of business folks who are willing to go to an event and talk about all the problems they're having in their business. But that's kind of what you have to do if you want to learn and if you want to figure out how to fix stuff and how to be successful. It's that level of authenticity and vulnerability that creates this positive environment. I've never been to any other event that has been so rewarding as well as so welcoming than going to a One Million Cups event, whether it's been in Albuquerque or whether it's been in Austin or any other city that I've been to that has it. And there's, I think, 200 different organizations that they have across the United States that, that do this event. And because the event is all focused on helping one another, the networking that happens afterward isn't selfish. You're not going there to say, this is what I do, and, and you should call me if you have any questions about it. It's always about, well, what do you do? And, oh, you know what? Let me connect you with somebody. And, oh, you know what? I have this resource. And and it's all of this this more positive atmosphere that's created because of the way that the event is is structured. That is fantastic. You know, we think about a lot of, you know, things like a lot of Chamber of Commerce events and a lot of other networking events, which are, you know, they're fun. They're fantastic events and great opportunities to meet people and find different potential clients and business partnerships. But that's a very different flavor than the flavor of coffee you're getting at One Million Cups. And it is something that is just such a draw that it, it just grows organically from people saying, I got so much good advice from this event. And I wasn't even the speaker, just <laughs> hearing about other people talk in depth about their their problems. And even if, in though it wasn't part of my industry that I'm a part of, I never asked myself that question about my own business. And now I have a whole bunch of notes to be able to go home and really start contemplating on. Excellent. And that also points to one of the other key things we hear more and more people talking about when it comes to public speaking these days is authenticity. You have to be able to tell your story authentically. And if you don't do that in an, at an event like uh, like the One Million Cups event, you're just not going to get the value out of the event. Exactly. And I feel like authenticity is one of those terms that sometimes people don't understand exactly what that means. And that's why I like using the term more of the vulnerability. It's it's the, this is the things that I don't know. These are the things that I failed on. These are the things that make me human and, and not just this Goliath that uh, is impenetrable. And it really not only helps to focus on those things so you could improve, but also helps you connect to the rest of your audience. Now, you've also then spoken 
across the world in South Africa. Did, did you set out to become an international speaker or, or how did you find yourself in South Africa on stage? Actually, I owe that 100% to that One Million Cups organization. So they are actually connected to an international organization called the Global Entrepreneurship Congress that happens every single year in a different major city around the world. And they bring in 165 165 countries, representatives from each of those to be able to talk about the state of entrepreneurship around the world. They were interested in getting a One Million Cups style event on the international stage in the countries that they are represented in. But the Kauffman Foundation can't do anything outside the United States. So they sent me and two other representatives from the United States to go and actually do two days of One Million Cups events and then do a panel where we talked about what it takes to be able to set up a One Million Cups in your city. It was quite the experience. It was the first time I got a chance to go outside the United States in in years since I had lived in Italy and being able to go into South Africa and not only see that country and and all the entrepreneurship and all of the different businesses that were happening there, but all of the other countries that were represented and see how hungry that they were to really get this, again, positive events going where they are locally. So was there anything different about that international audience versus the domestic audiences you were more used to speaking with? Mm, That's a great question. I would say that the point that stood out to me the most was that each country had some very specific cultural needs that we kind of had to tweak on, you know, getting into their society and and not saying that because we do it in the United States this very specific way that you have to have a, an exact replica of what we're doing here in your country, but to do it slightly more generally so that it could be tweaked towards the customs that you currently have and the, the needs that you have inside your your specific city, inside your specific culture and, and, and needs. And that was something that I didn't realize I was going to have to deal with as much because I thought that entrepreneurship and business was universal and it was the same everywhere. And of course, you know, it was it, you know, different laws and tax structures and and the way that you do contracts are, are going to be different in each one of those places, but how you present business and um, even some countries were very strict on still having a separation in between males and females, females talking to a, a group of men in some countries is, is still actually an issue. So you have to create events where they are still separated or that you have the ability to present to an audience that that adheres to their local laws. Hmm. Fascinating. That's got to provide some also interesting challenges, too, when you start thinking about how do you go ahead and help s- set up structures that you might be that personally morally opposed to. And how do you balance those needs with the needs of the organization sponsoring with the cultural needs that, you know, as an individual, you can't necessarily change around the world. Exactly. And that's, that's, it's, it's where you're trying to balance your own desire for absolute equality, as well as trying to give access to as many people as possible. So is the 1 million cups program also what led to your TEDx talk? It was through connections that I made through that event. So there is a professor at the University of New Mexico called Stacy Sacco. He's one of these 
diamond into rough professors that is just absolutely connected to the community. He knows so many different people across so many different industries. He's a professor of marketing there. However, he will talk about going into a engineering conference and just go and starting to, to talk to people about what they do. Not, not really knowing anything about what the conference is about or knowing anybody there, but just being so interested in what's going on. So he decided that he and another gentleman were going to host a TEDx event specifically for entrepreneurship in Albuquerque. And he and I, after the events one at One Million Cups, would continue talking about this concept that we had about kind of this self-reliance and uh, what really is self-reliance on a general scale as well as what self-reliance is for entrepreneurs. And we kind of started talking about that in terms of being a do-it-yourself kind of person. Instead of always going to somebody else for assistance, you know, how are you going to figure it out yourself? And these talks remained consistent on a weekly basis for a few months. And finally, he looked at me and said, you know, I'm doing this TEDx event and, and you should really do it sometime. And, and you should, you know, you should be a speaker there. And I was like, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, you know, maybe I'll do that. And I didn't even realize they had opened up their uh, applications for their speakers. But about a month before the event, he calls me up one afternoon and says, Charles, you know how I'm hosting that TEDx event? I said, yeah, absolutely, Stacy." He's like, well, you know that, that concept about DIY and, and that whole framework and this equation that we've been kind of putting together. He was like, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. He said, well, you, you should talk about that at, at, at the TEDx events. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, okay, well, what do I do or need to apply or anything? And he said, no, you're already part of it. Your first kind of run through with all of our coaches is going to be next week. I need a bio. I need your headshot. I didn't have headshots at that point. I was just kind of like, okay, well, it's game time, guys. This has been a, just a concept that we've been talking about. I haven't written a line of my speech at all at that point. <laughs> Point, and it was, uh, you know, it was go time. So I put all of that together and was ready for my first run through with the TEDx coaches uh, a week later with my headshots. That's that's kind of amazing how that how that comes together. So you had that week to put everything together. I mean, what did your preparation look like? I with Stacy was working with this equation and we had kind of figured out pieces of what that would look like together and it you know and um, adding in motivational factors and and trying to figure out it it wasn't anything like too mathematically complicated but it was something that we were trying to analytically figure out so we had like this kind of bare bones structure of what that looked like and i really started to delve deep into what that really meant on a, a shorter scale where I could explain, you know, these weeks long uh, worth of, com uh, of conversations together and, and really trying to be so concise within a TEDx talk. And, and, and my TEDx talk was only allowed for, they originally said seven minutes and I was able to do it in eight. And uh, they're a little bit shorter talks than the, the 15 or 30 minute talks that you get with, uh, with some of the other TED events. So really trying to be concise within all of our conversations and, and bringing that together. So I, I pulled up Google Drive and, and started typing away. And, and I love whiteboards. So drawing everything out and seeing it in front of me and, and you know, kind of putting up key phrases that I felt should be bullet points within the talk to kind of guide from one piece to the other and, and why that made sense. And the hardest part was trying to figure out a scale to be able to make the unquantified aspects of motivation into a quantifiable number. And that was something that I hadn't quite figured out by the first time that we did our coaching session, because the, I've got to say the first coaching session was rough. You know, I was, I was reading off of my iPad with my, my speech completely written out. You know, I was very, uh, I'd say a little bit, you know, robotic because I had just written and finished the final words before I'd, I'd showed up to the coaching session. And it, it still seemed a little 
all over the place and and they didn't quite even get the concept of what I was trying to work with. So it was really a practice in not only keeping as much information in there as possible, but also trying to dilute it into a, a more cohesive structure that flows from one part to uh, the other without having too much of this backstory of why I chose that specific part. That's awesome. What I really like about that process is in that process and that lead up to it, at no point was your priority to open up PowerPoint or Google Slides. Oh, absolutely not. In fact, that was the very last thing that I did as we were on our last coaching session. And they said, well, are you going to have some slides? And I was like, well, I guess I need some slides. You know, it was it was actually even something that I was considering doing without and just having a single slide with the equation that I had come up with. And that's awesome because you can do something. You know, PowerPoint is is an absolutely fantastic tool when used appropriately and when used to support the speaker uh, and not as a replacement for the speaker. Right. And that's actually something that through One Million Cups, every time that I would do coaching with somebody, we had a, a very actually rigorous coaching process that's even for just their six to eight minute talk, we spent about an hour and a half to two hours with each presenter, no matter if they were a professional public speaker or otherwise, because our talks were so specific, we spent that time to be able to meet with them at least three times and hear their, their talk all the way through at least twice before they ever presented. And one of the things that we really focused on was having that kind of structure inside your talk where if for some reason I always told them the TV blew up and you the, and electricity shut down, that you could have your speech ready to go and it would make sense even if you had absolutely no visual representation to be able to aid it. That's a very important skill for a speaker to acquire. So you've also, you also have, in addition to all this speaking and all these uh, events you've run, you also have uh, your own podcast, the Top Tech Tools podcast. Uh, what's the show about and why did you start it? Well, I have been wanting to do a podcast for years. I first wanted to do a podcast when I was working for a marketing company, and we were thinking about how that could be integrated into their pipeline, and and I never ended up actually convincing them that that was something that they wanted to invest in. And, and since then, it was it was something that I knew that I really had a desire to be able to to produce. And finally, I have had this consulting business for the past year and a half now. And it just seemed like the right time to be able to have something that was a little bit more abbreviated and concise where I had an area that the kinds of tools that I talk about and, and what I talk about is different kind of collaboration tools for entrepreneurs to use with their teams. And I needed a, a place where I could point to and easily say, these are the things that I most love about these specific tools and why I recommend them to people instead of having to say the same thing over and over and over mm -hmm. again. It was just something that was an easy resource for me to be able to make and, and identify some people that really were going in depth with what they were asking instead of just being a general, well, what do you think about, you know, this specific tool or what do you think about this CRM? It was an outlet for me to be able to honestly ease some of the questions that were coming my direction. Hmm. Awesome. And that means that when you do get then the follow-up, uh, questions the uh, from from folks who hire you for consulting is that they get more value out of that time because they've already familiarized themselves with you know the basics of what you're going to talk about and they can get deeper into an individualized solution. Absolutely, and it also helps me figure out with my own process with seeing whether or not they're going to be a good client that I want to work with and they're going to work with me. If I send them a link, 
And I asked them what they thought of the concepts that were inside that podcast. And they say they didn't listen to, and, and my podcast is actually very short. It's only 10 minutes and less to be able to get the full concept that I, I go through there. And if they can't listen to that 10 minutes, I know that whatever we talk about on the phone is not going to be something that's going to stick with them. And they're not going to be doing the necessary steps for us to be able to work together effectively. Right, right. And then their failure to execute those steps means that you don't get them as a success story either. Exactly. I, I want to work with people that are going to take appropriate action based off of the information that we talk about. Me just getting paid to talk to somebody and them not actually doing anything with that information is not good for anybody. They don't think that they got the value out of it. They don't get any kind of results. And from there, they think that I did something wrong. And I feel that it's not good for anyone of the people inside that transaction for them to be able to work together at all. Um, so having that as the baseline indicator that we are going to be a good group to work with, then that has made it so much easier. Awesome. So what's been the most surprising thing to come out of that project? The most surprising thing. So I have a really basic setup. When I mean a setup, I mean I record on my phone via the Anchor app that helps me distribute the podcast everywhere. And I was extremely surprised at all of the little sounds that my microphone picks up on my phone. <laughs> if I have the fan running or if there's something just very silent in the background that I don't think would get picked up, how good that just the basic tools that I have available with me right now um, are able to pick up all those little pieces that I didn't feel would actually make it into the, the final recording. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, 90% of what the brain does is ignore stuff and keep stuff from getting to your conscious mind. You know, all those sounds in the background that you hear when you record a podcast episode uh, are, are there all the time. And we're always hearing that we always have the sound of the freeway, the sound of the refrigerator, all these other sounds that are there. They're coming into our ears all the time. And the brain is just going irrelevant, 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 dump it, and then just focus on the key sounds you're supposed to hear. But the microphones, they don't ignore that. That is the the most surprising thing that when you do actually go back and, and focus on something, again, like you were saying, that is around you all of the time, you don't realize how noisy your environment really is. And no wonder we get distracted by all the little things when we're <laughs> at home and saying, oh, yeah, and I, I hear the, the dishwasher going and that reminds you, oh, I need to go do this. And and the little distractions that, that come up because we're, we're trying to – let's say ignore it, but you know, when, when we don't want to be working or when we're slightly un unmotivated to do something, the, the littlest thing can cause that distraction. <laughs> right. Right. And it's why it's, it, and it's one of the reasons why it's so creepy when suddenly you lose power, because not only do you oh, have yeah. that initial fear, but all of a sudden all those noises are gone. <laughs> <laughs> I love, honestly, I love losing power in my neighborhood because that's the best time to go out and talk to all the neighbors because everybody comes out of their house to then look around the rest of the neighborhood to see if they're <laughs> the individual house that just lost power. And it, it really is this, uh, you get the sense of community when the power's out. Right. And now, and, and you start asking, you're asking each other. So is this now the time we band together to defend against the zombies? <laughs> Right, because nobody has any idea of what's going on throughout the, the, the rest of the world because we are now completely disconnected from it. And it's, uh, it's, it's strange to feel like that again because you don't get that often. So if folks want to know more about you and what you're up to, where should they go? The two places I would say that they should go are charleswhiteservices.com, or if they just want to talk to me directly, I love Twitter. It is the, the best <laughs> tool to be able just to have this open public conversation, and I am at Charles Off White at Twitter. Huh. Awesome. So, Charles, thank you so much for uh, joining us this week. This has been great. 
thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. And uh, definitely, I would continue to work on my own public speaking skills. I'm going to be listening to your podcast to be able to pick up all of my my two minute tips from you guys. And uh, I look forward to having this uh, having this out there. Normally, when I put together an episode, I don't always well know what it's about. I mean, I do my core edit of the conversation where I listen to the whole thing, cut some stuff, and clean up the audio while while I take notes. And then I look over my notes, and sometimes I sit with it for a day or, or more. And it's only then in, in that process that I sort of start to realize what my guest and I actually talked about, because uh, I have a little bit of distance, and I'm not as caught up in the moment anymore. And then... I can write up my intro and outro comments like this and start working my show notes for an episode. And, well, that's my process. And that's how I came to realize that this week's episode really is all about process. Charles focuses on processes in his life. Process can be incredibly freeing. It gives you a structure for doing things. And once you have that structure in place, suddenly those tasks get a lot quicker. Often, when we talk about public speaking, we don't think about the process. We think about standing in front of the crowd with some slides. But 90% of the success of a talk is determined before you ever open your mouth. It's in your preparation and your planning. And when your preparation becomes repeatable and duplicatable, well, now you have a process. It's not as sexy as the roar of the crowd, but the right process can make your life so much easier. So to learn more about the work that Charles does or find his podcast, head on over to 2 minutetalktipscom slash Charles for all those links and more. Share this episode with a friend, colleague, or relative by giving them the link, 2 minutetalktipscom slash Charles. And, of course, as always, don't get best get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. Two Minute Talk Tips is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Network.